Hello, everybody. My name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake. I'm an author, idiot, and loin streamer. And today I wanted to talk about a book um, that affected the publishing industry. This is an article that was published more than a year ago, and it was also somewhat covered on a podcast I used to do. But those episodes don't exist anymore, and I still think that this is something worth talking about in general in regards to traditional publishing industry, how the industry has been affected in general over the years with the ideas of censorship, with the ideas of this is how you have to and can't write, and also after seeing film threat talk about this kind of thing happening in the the movie and television industry and with like Amazon's rule book for things because this has been going on for a very, very long time in the publishing industry and why things have changed and also why I gave up on traditional publishing pretty much years ago. Like there was a time between 2017 and 2018 that I was like eh, on the fence because of all of the stuff I saw from the industry while I was in college, when I was going to AWP, when I was being involved in events and looking at places to submit, looking at agent wish lists, submitting to agents, seeing how the industry was shifting and what they were demanding. And then I just, I tapped out. Partially because there was a lot of demand of, you need to fit this demographic, you need to out yourself. And I was like, I am not playing this political game. And there was also the realization that if you wanted to get into publishing in a traditional sense, then you needed to follow their rules. You needed to show your political allegiance by not writing certain things. And I already knew that Dead End Drive was specifically written too edgy for that. Not that not that Dead End Drive is even freaking edgy. It's just got jokes in there that certain people are not going to like if you are of a certain disposition. Um, I also, it's, it's there's, there's a kind of built-in test to Dead End Drive. Now, it's not like I'm trying to test anybody, but if people get mad at some of the stereotypes, but not all of the stereotypes, that's interesting. And if people get mad that a character is a little bit racist, but not uh, a murderer, not, they don't get mad at the fact that they're a murderer for money, that they are willing to murder children for money. Um, that's, that's also kind of interesting. Anyway, so I knew by, from the fact of what Dead End Drive is that it was never going to be published traditionally because of the ideas in it. And maybe that's what my mentor meant back at the time, that congratulations on how's it feel to be writing a book that's never going to be published because nobody in that school liked how it was written, what was written of it because of political, political differences. And... Um, I've been exceptionally sensitive to the same thing in the indie space because I've seen other political leanings doing the exact same thing of prove your alliance, prove that you do this the right way, prove that you feel the right things, that you support the right things in order to get my support. And so it was just something I was never willing to do. And this has affected people in all kinds of ways across the spectrum and it attempts to control people in indie space and in traditional space. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent here. We're going to cover how... Me this memoir was ruined and brought the publishing industry to a fight and how that has affected writing. And um, I, then I want to talk about why I think indie publishing is the way to go and why I think there is so much why I think there is so much hope in what we're doing. It's kind of is a great follow up, I think, to Wednesdays. This is kind of I think this is kind of a great follow up, I think, to Thursday's video talking about, you know, different likes, dislikes and what we can control by what we consume and what we uh, and what we control by, like, what we talk about and what we enjoy. And so let's get into this discussion. But before we get started, number one, if you enjoy what I do here on the channel, please remember to like, share, and subscribe for more. Number two, if you would like to be featured on the channel, check out the links down in the description below. The number one way to be featured is through Lemoy, the monthly prompt writing contest where I give you a prompt. You write a short story using that prompt. And on the first Monday video of the month, we bask in your creativity because you guys always bring it always bring the level 5000 creativity the second way to be featured is if you are an indie author and you have a book out or a book that is coming out if you submit your first chapter and your cover they will be read here on the channel to hopefully help more readers find your work because there is like there is a vast bank of creativity of stuff that has gone into the fresh me feature so many different genres so many different styles so many different authors it's crazy the stuff that's out there to, to discover. And I have discovered some of my favorite books through the Fresh Meat feature in the last year. So, you know, guys, take advantage of that. It's an easy way to kind of taste test a bunch of different books 
The third thing is if you would like to check out any of my books, they are linked in the description below and they're available at any of your favorite places to get books, including the local library upon request. So with that said, let's jump into this. Let's not bury the lead any further. The book that tore publishing apart, Harm Has Been Done and Now Everyone Is Afraid from The Guardian. This was published by Gabby Hinsleff in June of 2022. Let's be honest, there is a bunch of book drama going on all the time in the industry, and that's partially because everybody wants to control what everybody else is allowed to like, how everybody else is allowed to talk, and you're going to see that this specifically is about dictating a memoir, dictating the thoughts and feelings that a person actually had because they are considered too offensive to actually publish. I'm sorry, but life is offensive. People think offensive thoughts, and we've gotten to such a point that some not only and like you're allowed to be offended by things don't even take this in that way but the idea that somebody feeling offended by something or not liking the way that something is said or portrayed can somehow now control how everybody else can do things is pretty asinine so getting into this at the end of march a book that had been condemned to die came back to life there was no star studded launch and no great fanfare although the book is now somewhat famous the new publisher of the poet kate clanchy's memoir some kids i taught and what they taught me felt it wrong to cash in on the controversy that has engulfed it you know c good on them because a lot of people freaking you're trying to use controversy for clout. So the new edition, with some intriguing changes to the original text, were quietly resupplied to bookshops willing to restock them. What follows is a tale that reverberates well beyond publishing. It's about whose voice is heard, which stories are told, and by whom. But it is broader implications for working life too, particularly in industries where so-called culture wars raging through the outside world can no longer be left at the office door. Culture war is such a stupid thing. I'm sorry, I understand that what it is and what's going on, but it kind of ruins it for the rest of us because then it attempts to make every action, every choice, every belief into some kind of contentious issue that has to be corrected or you are a bad person instead of letting conversation happen and letting beliefs happen or letting different interpretations happen. When Some Kids first emerged in 2019, Clanchy was much admired for her work at an Oxford comprehensive teaching children from diverse backgrounds to write poetry with sometimes luminous results, a celebration of multicultural school life coupled with candid reflections on her own flaws. Some Kids was lauded by reviewers and won the Orwell Prize for political writing with the judges praising a brilliantly honest writer whose reflections were moving funny and full of love but then things began to unravel what's funny to me is like stuff that is unintentionally offensive because it's just like this is an observation this is something someone said this is an action this is how someone described themselves will be considered offensive even though that's how it really is but then you'll read books that are intentionally being aggressive stuff like jack of hearts which is like white or straight that which goes on to demonize straight people constantly which demonizes um women constantly stuff like there are things that go out of their way to villainize certain groups of people in not indirect ways and they are fine they are praised as being groundbreaking and then you get stuff like this where it's like oh there was this observation that i found freaking offensive so cancel the book can we not this is one of the things that makes people very angry is this double standard in November of 2020, a teacher posted on an amateur review website, Goodreads, that the book was centered on this white middle class woman's harmful, judgmental and bigoted race on view, class and body image using racist stereotypes to describe pupils. The authors, she said, wrote of their chocolate skin and almond eyes. I cannot believe you. <laughs> That we are at this point where any level of description is considered bad. If she described a white person as like milky, is that a problem? with grape eyes <laughs> like can we just Kanchi hit back initially on goodreads and then in july of 2021 on twitter claiming someone made up a racist quote and said that it was in my book and using her followers to challenge the review she said that she caused threats against her literary giants including the 75 year old children's author and president of society of authors philip pullman rose to her defense yet it quickly emerged that those phrases although not 
as we will later hear from Flanchi, everything attributed to her, were in the book. Her prickly response not only sat awkwardly with some kid's theme of a narrator open to learning about herself, who one who believed that she wrote that deep down most people are prejudiced, that I am, that prejudice happens in readings of poetry as well as everything else, but had unintended consequences from her critics too. So like, if you look at even some of the teachings that these people believe or perpetuate from other things, such as like, everybody is racist, everybody has to contend with these prejudices on the inside and you are racist and just freaking deal with it. Even when you have these people that agree with their ideology and say, yes, I do this thing and this is me learning better against that thing, those admissions are still used against them in order to remove them. So you can never be better than your worst self in these ideologies. You can never learn. You can never actually be human because any actual humanity in you is going to be used against you as proof that you are a bad person. Oh, you aren't perfect. You didn't follow anything. Well, you can't follow anything because you are and will always be prejudiced no matter what you do. That is what these people do. Three writers of color, Monisha Rajesh, Professor Sunny Singh, and Shimane Soliman, men who had challenged Clancy on Twitter endured months of racist abuse and sometimes violent threats despite Clancy's own publisher Picador describing their criticisms as instructive and clear-sighted. So didn't didn't the author of this book receive racist criticisms and people making up lines that weren't even in her book in order to call her racist? And so you started it. You started getting pushback and then you said that you were the only victims after you victimized somebody else. Like, it's just, it's what happens. And I hate that this is part of the conversation, that this is part of where it all goes, is it's a bully picking a fight with somebody, that person is victimized, and then people start pushing back, and the bullies are like, help me, help me, I just got slapped, did you see that? Girl, at this point, it's freaking war. You started it. Don't act like you're some kind of innocent party. An 18-year-old autistic writer named Dara McNulty, who had questioned Planchi's description of two autistic pupils as jarring company, was forced off social media by abusive messages. I mean, don't get involved. Honestly, just don't get involved. You don't have to get involved. The thing with this also is that in these cases, if somebody has a mental illness or a neurological disorder, and then they use that as a defense to enter into a conversation, one, they're trying to use it as a point of authority to be like, well, listen to me. One, your experience is not everybody else's experience. And it can be jarring to experience somebody else who is mentally different than you. That's normal. It's not insulting. It just is what it is. And you can find it insulting if somebody goes, knowing you is jarring. People talking to me think that I'm jarring. It's just what happens. And you have to under understand that people are going to have different experiences with you if you are a different type of personality. And sometimes it takes getting used to. It just is what it is. But there are also too many people trying to use their personal experience and their identification with something as a way to correct others and say, no, you aren't allowed to have that experience because I identify as this thing. I created this thing. I am this thing. And so for you to say that is a direct insult to me. Now you're dismissing somebody else's experience in something. It's just a description of it. It's, it's That's how you understand other people is you accept that they have a different experience. They're explaining that experience and it's not an insult. It just is what it is. And when you get in fights on Twitter, expect for it to get bad because Twitter is toxic above all else. Anyway, Picador, having initially apologized, saying Clanchi would rewrite the book, then announced this January that it was part in company with her by mutual consent. She has suggested that some kids would have been pulped, made Mark Richard, co-founder of a new publishing house, Swift, not bought this right. Clanchi lost one of her parents and got divorced in the same year her career imploded. Meanwhile, disclosed in December that she at times had felt suicidal, of course. Every, like, everybody suffers. So I feel like getting involved in, one, uh, a non-necessary thing on Twitter because you're like, oh, you said something, now I need to fight you on it. You don't need to get involved in it. If your mental health is already weak, don't get involved on it so you get chased off of the internet. And if you do that, just acknowledge that you don't need to be there. Yeah, it can be very difficult. Everybody goes through experiences of harsh criticism, especially the more you get involved in something contentious and public, The Shad videos on this channel, it is insane how <laughs> how worked up people get, regardless of what side you're on, uh, when it's just a book review. Especially the sides that like Shad and then I don't like his book. It is pretty intense. It's literally just a book review. Touch some grass, you guys. But, like, it's crazy. And you can, not to say that the emotional response to 
to controversy online isn't real, but know that you need to step back. That is a you thing, especially when you're dealing with other things like her being divorced and losing a parent. That's a lot to go through to then on top of this other stuff where people are dragging your reputation, dragging who you are over literally just a book that you wrote about your experiences and thoughts. And they're like, well, your thoughts are evil. I'm sorry I described somebody as chocolate. What? Anyway, the row erupted as an anxious time for publishing. Following similar pushback at novels ranging from Janine Cummings' 2020 book, American Dirt, whose portrayal of a migrant Mexican family was critically acclaimed, until Latin American writers accused its author, who is of Irish and Puerto Rican heritage, of peddling stereotypes and inaccuracies to the queer black author Kosoko Jackson's A Place for Wolves, a gay love story set during the Kosovo War that was withdrawn in 2019 at the author's request after Goodreads reviewers attacked his representation of Muslim characters. How about just not associating yourself with characters because of labels and actually like just reading the book for what it is. And then you can determine based on that. But like the level of control that random people want over other people's fiction is one of the reasons why I gave up on even bothering with this stuff. Give me helpful feedback or I don't care. And it wouldn't matter what your feedback is <laughs> if it didn't end up in cancellations of books. Like, okay, fine. Say that those Muslim characters are freaking terribly written the book can still be out there because I get uh, there are people that disagree with that. Like, go and look at Jackson, go and look at Kosoko's Jackson's book reviews on Goodreads, and go and look at Janine Cummings' reviews on Goodreads. You get fives, you get zeros, you get this book should never have been published, you get this is a great representation, this is, and then you get this is just a story because it's not a representation. Like, you get all across the spectrum. That's a world that we can live in, not a world where one person's feelings dictates whether or not you get published. That's the problem. The Nobel Prize winner, Kazuo Ishiguro, has recently suggested authors are running scared of an anonymous lynch mob online, whilst the novelist Sebastian Folks vowed no longer to describe female characters' appearances after being criticized for doing so in the past. Debates rage over whether these are long overdue correctives or representative of stifling of the imagination, whether art has the right to offend, or whether publishing would be navigating all of these less clumsily if there weren't a predominantly white middle class industry itself. So feedback, just because somebody says something, doesn't mean that it needs to change. That's one of the problems here. And one of the problems I consistently run into in both giving feedback and just talking about books is that just because somebody has an interpretation does not mean that you have to change your book or that you are right or they are wrong. It is just somebody's interpretation. And art is always going to have multiple interpretations, multiple experiences, and you cannot control the experience of the reader. So the fact that they are so focusing on trying to control what the writer is writing to control what the reader is allowed to see, it goes also with what Film Threat is talking about recently in their guidelines for what you are allowed to write in movies and what stereotypes are not allowed and why the industry in general, the, the, the traditional industry, whether it's books or movies, movies is going to die at this rate because it is constraining to single thought and it doesn't help when an author also tries to do that to the reader so when a reader can look at a book and say i find this offensive cool good to hear why do you find it offensive i just want to i just want to know better what you're responding to and that's fine but if the author was like well why do you find this offensive oh you don't like that it's chocolate well a lot of people describe people looking like chocolate. A lot of people use this stuff. You're, you're the one that's ridiculous for feeling that. Receiving and understanding somebody's perspective is completely different than trying to correct them and then tell them to see things how you see them. And in both cases, if it's the readers saying do better authors and publishers to not publish this stuff because you can only write one way, is the same thing as the author turning on the reader to say you must read my book a certain way. Both are wrong. You're going to have differences in reading and that needs to be allowed. The differences in construction, in discussion, in conversation about the books needs to happen because that's how you expand understanding, that's how you read deeper into stories, and that's how you see different perspectives and lifestyles and understandings through the interpretation of the same media. And stop blaming white people for everything that you don't like, because now you're just saying, take white people out of this job and then things will be better. Racist. 
That some kids got so far without ringing alarm bells merely confirms some of its critics' suspicions of a business employing many people like Clanchy, but few who resemble her pupils. Yet others in the industry are troubled that one writer who seemingly left to face the fallout alone as a scapegoat for wider collective sins. It was a group fail, says one veteran agent, who asks to remain anonymous. I think the publishers failed in their duty to care for the writer. I think that the author failed in her duty to care for her pupils and in saying that she didn't write what she did. No Nobody emerges from the story well. Harm has been done, and now everyone is afraid. No harm is done by describing a character as chocolate. I'm sorry. <laughs> Fight me. White people get called get called mayo monkeys all the time. Okay, just please. Monisha Rajish in Sweden on a train heading for an Arctic Circle when we spoke when we speak. I'm sorry, I had an aneurysm reading that. A travel writer, she is enjoying returning to work that she loves after a stressful few months. Lots of people criticize some kids, she points out, including hundreds of teachers who signed an open letter questioning whether Clanchy, who carefully anonymized her pupils for publication, had adequately safeguarded them. But it was Rajesh plus fellow writers plus Singh and Suleiman who were identified as leading the Twitter charge for what she feels were quite obvious reasons, the angry brown people trope. Avalanches of racist hate mail ensued. Every time the story hit the headlines, she'd log into social media or get someone else to sift her emails, but even then she says it was unavoidable. I would start getting WhatsApps from friends saying, are you okay? And I'm like, Oh God, another one. It preoccupies you. I'd be trying to put my kids to bed and I'd get a WhatsApp. It's never ending. Look, you get involved in a conversation, you're going to deal with the fallout, like the responses to that conversation. This just sounds like somebody that wanted to push back on something and receive literally no pushback back. If you get aggressive, if you get involved in these things, and I understand that and getting involved in this conversation, that people are going to disagree with you. And that's fine. If you don't want to this agreement, then don't get into it. But we're at this point in a lot of these conversations where people use these identity monikers to say, basically, you can't respond to me or else I am above you on this, on this hierarchy of opinions because of my identification markers and that's also why people go this is my trauma this is my mental illness this is my sexuality and in places to make it act like they are now some point of authority because of those things when they are not you still get feedback and do you think that you saying you getting hate mail is any different than what the author of this book was getting no because everybody was getting it because everybody thinks that their opinion is more important than it is and they're not talking with you they're talking at you as a mother of two young daughters Rajesh was upset by the general lack of kindness and Clanchy's often very physical descriptions of children. The butch-looking Pakistani girl with her distinct mustache, the Essex boy with the Ashkenazi nose, who's surprised her by denying that he has Jewish roots, the white girl from council estates, whom she deems not pretty or destined to end up fat like their mothers. The text is peppered with references to children's Somali height, Cypriot boss bosoms, Cypriot bosom bosoms, Cypriot bosoms, or one star pupils, Mongolian ferocity. But something's about it also stirred painful memory from Rajesh's own school days. Look, can I just I can't. After reading Slay by Brittany What's Her Face Morris, like I don't care. If you're offended by something, like, it just happens. People write offensive stuff in fiction. You can dislike it, but trying to dictate whether or not it should be published and whether or not somebody should be reckoned for because you found something offensive is small-minded. Especially when we're talking about memoir, because memoir is the personal thoughts and opinions and feelings that somebody went through. So you're going to get hurtful stuff. People are just that way. And so... Don't go into stuff expecting to feel like you're reading an angel and then get upset when you're reading a human being that is flawed. It's crazy to me that people expect to read memoirs and then get mad when a memoir is not a perfect person. And also that, ugh, how, how likely is it that this person would have been better reading a memoir about somebody who murdered people as long as they weren't racist in the descriptions, as long as they didn't describe that Pakistani girl as having a mustache? Like, it's crazy. 
I had teachers like her, she says quietly. I had teachers who did absolutely put me to one side as being a small child with a fur furry, fury, furry, with a furry eyebrows or the stash, and they made you feel like outsiders without necessarily meaning to do it, but they did. And it didn't matter how well meaning they were, it did make you feel small and troubled you later in life. That's just something that happens. You're not a specific victim. I had people do that in church. I had people do that in school. I was always the little one. I was always the fat one. I had people do that to me at Pokemon Card Club. Pokemon Card Club, where all of us lamos go when I was like seven or eight years old and I was the fat one called a freaking cupcake who waddled everywhere. I got made fun of for being fat at, at church too. <laughs> it just, it happens. You can be the outsider no matter where you are, who you are. I got kicked out of church before for wearing trip pants because I, the, the pastor thought I looked demonic. I was a teenager. Come on. It just happens. And then you adjust and you go and find friends elsewhere. That's just how it is. I'm like, people make fun of me for being homeschooled without even knowing it because they're like, homeschoolers are poorly adjusted. And then I see this and I'm like, how come I can deal with being rejected and go find somewhere else to be? But this person is like, I can't deal with people making me feel like an outsider. Stop looking for other people to affirm you. Get your, get your self-esteem from yourself. She rejects accus accusations of trying to cancel Clanchi as a writer. You're not being canceled, you're being challenged. You're not used to being challenged. And now that you are, you don't know what to do about it. And it's only going to happen more now that marginalized readers and editors feel more empowered. All it boils down to is, please stop writing about us like this. Look, you're not being written about. The children in her class are being written about. She's writing a memoir. She's being vulnerable. That's what happens when you write a memoir. This is self-serving. And to be like, oh, you're not being canceled. You're being challenged. You're not being punished. You're being held accountable as they whip your back. Like, come on. Don't play these freaking sophistic, sophistic. <laughs> Don't play these stupid word games. You're seen for what you're doing. In the book, Clanchy writes indignantly about how her pupils lost out of white children in the book, Clanchy writes indignantly about her pupils lost out to white children in the judging of literary prizes or rarely saw themselves represented in books. Her supporters point to her years of ad advocacy of marginalized youngsters whose poetry she published in anthologies. For, but for Rajesh, the implication that a good liberal couldn't have aired feels short-sighted. The narrative started to swing towards, but the narrative started to swing towards, but this wonderful woman who's done this wonderful stuff with these children's poetries, how on earth could you possibly fault someone like that? And I felt that it was a real blind spot. The row wasn't even about Clanchy personally, she says, so much as what publishing was enabling. No, it is, because you called Clanchy racist for her discussion descriptions you discount any action that she actually does towards doing things because in the eyes of these people you are the original sin and there is nothing that you can do to outrun it you just have to get on your knees whenever they say get on your knees there is nothing they do not accept humanity they do not accept failure and then they don't see failure in themselves or bigotry in themselves which is actually what's happening here this is bigotry to say you should never have been published because this is publishing ideas or thoughts or things that i do not like that's what it is and bigotry is defined as an intolerance for other ideas. For many of its critics, some kids crystallized deeper frustrations with an industry avowedly keen to change yet seemingly slow to do so. Publishing has moved on since days when, in one agent's words, everyone was called Sebastian. In March, the Publishers Association announced its target for 15% of staff to come from ethnic minority groups that, that had finally been met. And while a 2016 survey of the trade magazine, the bookseller found fewer than 100 of a thousand of books published that year were written by people of color, research from the publishers' associations suggests that numbers may now have risen. Nonetheless, suspicions persist that, as one novelist of Asian heritage puts it, it's still easier for white people to get published writing about minority communities than for people from those communities to break through. People want the diverse voices, but they want white people to write those diverse voices. The staff aren't diverse, so they will read a manuscript and feedback that you'll get this. I couldn't relate to this. I don't relate to these situations. And it's like, well, no, you wouldn't. So that also shows, one, a, a small-mindedness to understanding how empathy works and sympathy works, not just from somebody going, I don't really, I can't, I can't relate to this, which you're not going to relate to everything. There are certain things that a lot of people can't relate to. Even being a female, there are certain female experiences that I can't 
relates to because I just don't think and live like that. But I read books of different experiences in order to see how other people think, even if I don't relate. It's that logic of seeing how it works that helps me relate. However, this person going, oh, well, yeah, of course you wouldn't. You never would because you're not me. That shows a failure on you that you also think that other people who are not from your background can never understand or ex the experiences that you've had. That's also incorrect. Also, there's I hate this thing that obviously these numbers exist. So now I'm going to make assumptions as to why these are the numbers that exist. You don't have proof. You're just making assumptions. And I think it actually complicates and makes it impossible to have a conversation when both sides are saying I'm being discriminated against and both sides are saying, no, you're lying. Like, obviously there is something going on, but, but some are so emotionally invested that there is an inability to actually discuss what is being seen and why it is being seen. And maybe that there is more nuance to this conversation, to this situation than strictly some sort of bigotry against people in every single facet because the publishing industry is made up of a bunch of individual people all operating independently but that must be impossible right amy may baxter was still publishing trainee in 2019 when she founded bad form an online magazine for writers of color i didn't know any who were being published and i didn't know anywhere that i could go and find out about the ones who were she explains now 25 she got into publishing herself via a penguin random house scheme for graduates from marginalized backgrounds. She now works for a dialogue book imprint led by one of the few senior black figures in publishing, Shermaine Lovegrove. Three years on, Baxter reckons most of the scheme benefactor benefic beneficiaries have left publishing. People come in at the bottom, they suffer and then they leave, and that's why the numbers aren't changing. I'm white passing Asian and often I'm the darkest person in the room. So just so you know, this right here where it says a scheme specifically for this there are no schemes specifically to let white people into things like i was not given any of these opportunities and this is something that i constantly saw when i was applying for um magazines and for publishers where they were specifically looking for certain backgrounds which included your sexual background your sex background like your sexual identification background and just stuff that i don't want to give out and be published for uh so this is discriminating against people based on demographics and giving opportunities to people there are no only apply to this if you are white only apply to this if you are a man there is only this for the marginalized backgrounds for the sexually mar marginalized backgrounds as some say and you or for the neurologically the neurodivergent background so now you have to disclose all of this information if you want to be published because otherwise they're not going to give you the chance in a lot of these cases this March was a huge month for bad form, thanks to a flurry of black authored titles commissioned in response to the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests finally hitting the shelves. Her worry, however, is that they are all now competing with each other, meaning that some might not sell as well as they otherwise could have. The real test may come later this year when these writers seek a second book deal. <laughs> so like the problem here is, oh, they all got published, so now they're competitors. What does she want? Yes, when you get published, I mean, technically, I don't think books are really competitors with one another another but if you release 20 different books at once then people are obviously gonna have to pick between which ones they want to get but like there is no winning here it's like you flood the system with them and then they're like well now they're competitive so now people are not going to purchase all of them this is just a dominance thing that's all that it is sites like bad form are part of the changing dynamic within publishing whereby word of mouth buzz on instagram book talk a powerful influencer community of generation z's favorite social media channels and grassroots sites like goodread increasingly drive sales alongside established industry forces such as major bookstores and newspaper review sections book talk says baxter shifts books like you wouldn't believe a book like the spanish love deception by the spanish writer elena armas that's been in the sunday times bestseller list for two weeks in a row and it's been out for over a year it's amazing and all because a bunch of teenage girls liked it enough to make 10 second videos about it. By comparison, Twitter doesn't sell many copies, but it's where writers, agents, editors come to research ideas, gossip, and argue in public. <laughs> True. Despite the vitriol of its exchanges, Rajesh says the site was nonetheless one of the few places marginalized writers could be heard on the subject of some kids. After tweeting about it, she says she was swamped with private messages from younger publishing staff saying, thank you for what the three of you did because we felt that this for a long time and we're too scared to speak up. Crucially, some of them came from inside Picador. But what about the people that agreed with some kids? Like, 
the people that don't like it are not the only people that exist or the only people that matter. Like, pro and con voices do matter. Last December, Picador's publishing director, Philip Gwyn Jones, told the Daily Telegraph that he regretted not being braver in defending Polanyi, adding that younger staff seemed to believe that they must agree with every book that they issued. That's a problem. Look, you don't have to agree with everything that comes out. You are never going to do that. I don't even agree with everybody in my family. I don't even agree completely with all of my friends. I don't know what the standard is, which is get in freaking line, agree with everything. That is an unattainable standard. His words triggered such an internal black backlash. His words of you don't have to agree with everything that goes through your workplace. Bro, I don't even agree with the terms that I work under at my actual day job. It's just the way that things are. His words triggered such an internal backlash that he was forced to apologize, vowing to use my privileged position as a white middle-class gatekeeper with more awareness. Oh my gosh, chicken, chicken. Tell the children to shut up or get a different job. You can hire someone else. Stop bowing to this. While Picador's insistence that this were not the imprint's views sparked rumors of internal division. Few in the industry will now discuss this painful subject on the record. Grow up this clanchy fallout is not the only subject that is off the table in the publishing circles there are certain authors or subjects people just won't touch because you know what the reaction will be on social media people don't want to be sworn out says a rival publisher i've heard mid-ranking people in publishing say i'd love to say something about that but i've got a mortgage to pay it's a really unhappy situation where everyone i know is having conversations behind closed doors the fear is not just an inadvertent publishing something problematic but being accused of microaggressions against a junior staff the junior staff are controlling everything you might think that we have a lot of power but they have a lot of power on social media to destroy someone everyone is saying half jokingly am i going to get canceled so this is also kind of a big problem where people are using social media or clout chasing or buzzwords in order to whip up frenzies against people whether it's true or not because people are more prepared to attack immediately and find out the truth later and that's always been a problem because people respond immediately to the stimuli, to the blood dropped in the water. And if they want to be angry, they want to be angry. It's something that we've seen time and time again of let me assume where you're coming from, what you mean. Funny, again, with the Shad stuff, with the uh, Shadow of the Conqueror book reviews and the people coming in there just to be angry, determining what you think and what you believe and who you are without even knowing it. It happens all the time, and people are more than prepared to cancel whoever they want, regardless of political beliefs. What's often portrayed as a generational divide, pitching woke young millennials against the aging establishment, is in reality not so simple. Like the arts and academia, publishing is historically left-leaning and tends to attract the idealistic and value-driven at all ages. But it's also dominated by recruits who can afford to do unpaid internships and move to London. The net result, it's pu the net result this publisher argues, is an intake of privileged graduates anxious to compensate for their privilege and growing resistance to publishing conservative voices that they might disagree with. More than one industry source dates that tension to Brexit and the rise of Donald Trump, leaving many young staffers in particular keen to not fuel what they see as dangerous fires. And that just means publishing whatever ideas or even personalities, character tropes, character types that they do not deem appropriate. You know, like Alex would not be acceptable. The situation between Doc and Alex would not be acceptable. I already know that, which is, again, why I gave up on publishing traditionally, because I'm like, I'm not playing this game. I'm not going to let anybody censor my work. And then, like, looking at some of the newer things, people wouldn't... There there are certain group people in these groups that would not like Marcella and Tommy because of their situation, because of Tommy's background, because of the relationship between Tommy and Marcella. I mean, that's a, that's a big one. Especially because Marcella is, like, such a caregiver. She's... <laughs> She's like a born mommy and she is so ready to take care. She just loves taking care of the people that she cares about. So it's just like, oh, she is so sweet. Anyway, it goes so far beyond just political things because obviously we see if you call somebody chocolate, like it's problem, freaking problems. You can't even publish true memoirs anymore because of possibility of offensiveness.
Last year, more than 200 employees at the U.S. publisher Simon & Schuster signed a petition urging the firm not to publish the memoir of Trump's Vice President Mike Pence. Similar protests followed across the industry over books of the right-wing philosopher Jordan Peterson and the alt-right activist Milo Yiannopoulos. While in Britain, some staff at J.K. Rowling's publisher Hatchet were unhappy about working on her children's picture book, The Ichabog, in light of Rowling's views on trans rights. This again just shows more purity testing on why you are not allowed to think or be anything other than what they want you to be. And an, a similar thing is attempting to, or has been attempted to be established in the indie space among groups that are like building their positions as, hey, we believe in indies, we believe in alternatives, but we'll only let you in if you agree with us politically. The author of the two big gender critical feminist books published last year in Britain, Helen Joyce's trans When Ideology Meets Reality and Kathleen Stock's Material Girls have both described battling to get published in Britain and neither got U.S. publishing deals. Coraline Hardman, the literary agent who originally approached Stock and suggested that she write the book, stresses that it is not uncommon for multiple editors to reject the title before one accepts it, but confirms that several editors passed on it. Some people were saying nobody will buy it. There's no interest in this topic, but that wasn't what I was seeing in real life. There was a groundswell of grassroot feminism and I had become aware of the Gender Recognition Act consultation on making it easier to self-identify as trans. I was thinking, this is really a big thing, she says. I did have some people who were interested, but they knew that they would get backlash internally. So a lot of people scared to actually publish or be involved with publishing controversial ideas. So don't tell me that you're brave as you fear people saying things on social media, in which case publishers and... um, Publishers and employers need to stand by their choices and be like, look, we publish ideas even if we don't agree with it. Because by censoring stuff based on whether you agree with it or not, stuff that you let through means that you are implying that you agree with that content. Eventually, Joyce's books became the best sellers for One World. Some editors have since written to me and said, I wish I had been braver, says Hardman. But while Stock and Joyce have proved there's a market for gender critical writing, Hardman isn't sure that it will be easier for others to follow. You will get pushback, particularly in the US, which means you don't stop and let it freeze you. Like, yeah, everybody, every time you put out an opinion, any kind of opinion, you could freaking put out, I like waffles. Somebody is going to determine they need to push back and say, but pancakes are better, but cereal is better. But why do you like waffles? It's a freaking carb. And you know that carbs make you fat? Like, what is the point? You're always going to get pushback and you have to determine whether or not you care. That will always be a question. I have gotten more and more pushback based on some of the videos that I have done more recently. And some of them are, some of the pushback is very personal, very insulting and attempting to get a a reaction. And the best thing that you can do is not freaking care because it doesn't matter. And I know that there's an internal thing that's like, look, I care because I know that that is untrue. And now people are saying untrue things about me. And now other people who don't know me are going to believe that untrue thing. Publishers and agents and business relationships need to stand by those people to say, look, you don't have to agree with them, but we need to have this conversation. We need to have a variety of opinions and discuss this stuff and allow it to be. And people are scared. People are scared of having negative opinions about them. The American publisher Skyhorse has established a reputation for publishing titles canceled by the rivals, including Blake Bailey's biography of the novelist Philip Roth, dropped following allegations of sexual harassment against Bailey, who denies any wrongdoing, and Woody Allen's memoir. Some have wondered whether Clanchy's new publisher Swift and Visage and Visages and Visages, a similar anti-cancel culture model here. But when asked if this was the thinking behind free publishing some kids, Richard says with feeling, there are easier ways to make money. He and his business partner simply felt that the book should be available and that nobody else would do it. What I would say is that we feel that publishing has a duty to stand by its authors and in that particular case this hasn't happened. Picador, which has held its tongue since severing ties with Clanchy, did not want to comment on this piece, but the publisher's unwillingness to defend the book, whose every line it had previously cleared for publication, still puzzles some of its rivals. As a founder of the feminist publishing house Virago, who, home of the writer from Margaret Atwood to Maya Angelou, Cameron Khalil is known for pushing the boundaries and publishing. She once resigned from a judging panel of the International Booker Prize rather than to see it go to Roth, yet another North American, at the expense of writers beyond the English-speaking world. Now 83 and retired from the industry, although still writing her own books, she is one of few senior figures prepared to reflect openly on some kids. She feels that both Clancy, Clancy and Pullman, whose publisher 
asked him to apologize for supporting Clanchi were badly failed. The first duty of a publisher is to their authors. If in neither case did the publisher go to the author and say, it looks like we are in trouble here. What would you like me to do about it? She says. Khalil resigned from the Society of Authors after concluding it had sided with Clanchi's critics, something that she blames on the author, Joanne Harris, chair of its management committee, who declined to be interviewed for this piece. While Khalil does concede that you can't call children chocolate colored, she feels like Clanchi's years of helping young people find their voices should count for something. The point that Philip Pullman was making is that these are terrible times for writers if you're not going to be allowed to say things that are within the bounds of human understanding that aren't racist by massive intention. Last month, Pullman resigned from the Society of Authors, saying that he did not feel free to express his opinions in the post. The historian and writer Marina Warner also quit, warning of a climate of anxiety among authors. By email, Pullman says that most dismayed him was the instant and unthinking cowardice on the part of publicists, organizations, institutions, corporations, the rush to abase themselves and to try and to make people like me abase themselves too in the face of politically based criticism. The idea that writers who tackle difficult subjects cannot rely on their publishers backing in a storm clearly alarms some. One literary agent was approached recently by a white writer asking if it was still acceptable to write a mixed race character. I said, yes, you're a novelist. Of course you can. But what you have to do is prove that you have done proper research and that you're not just objectifying the characters. That is what fiction is for. It's to do with looking through other people's eyes. But in nonfiction, she concedes, a more permanent shift may be underway. Maybe we've too easily thought that we can tell anybody's story without any deep understanding. But that includes trying to tell Clanchy that you can tell Clanchy's story without understanding where Clanchy was coming from. Like, people think, I can impose what my version of truth and, and experience is onto you and that yours isn't legitimate if I don't like it. That's not the freedom of expression. That is not exploring other people's perspectives. That is forcing your perspective on other people. And you can see the other person's perspective, say you don't like it without trying to force your version on top of it. Just say, this is how I interpreted it. This is what I see and have a conversation around that as opposed to rewrite it how I say. Like every feedback does not have to be put into place. And you can have multiple things be true at once, multiple perspectives be true at once. That's just it. Also, uh, get back to me when it's, oh, these books are all about seeing from other perspectives. I'm sorry, get back to me with all of the freaking dark romances that are romancing freaking rapists that haunt you in your house and write men unrealistically. Like, don't at me with this. There are different types of stories that exist, okay? One option for writer is enlisting a sensitivity or authenticity reader who uses their own lived experience to advise on whether a text feels clumsy. To some, that's censorship. Spectator, columnist, and novelist Lionel Shriver has said that she'd rather quit writing, and to others, it's an unsatisfactory compromise, allowing famous white authors to expand their repertoire rather than enabling more authentic voices to break through. But growing numbers agree that the author Juno Dawson, who used a sensitivity reader for a mixed race character in her new novel on the grounds that if she had accidentally caused offense, I'd rather know while the book was a word to document and not on the shelves themselves. But that is assuming that whoever your sensitivity reader is counts to cover their opinions of literally everybody who identifies as the same thing. You can't do that. There is no way. And that one person or two people is not going to cover every single opinion of anybody. That is not a monolith. It is insanity. Georgina Kamiska is a sensitivity reader for South Asian characters and everything from adult fiction to picture books. She checks for historical accuracy, authenticity, and anything that is insensitively makes her wince. The general idea is to make sure that it'll do no harm. There's nothing in there that's offensive or wrong or will give the wrong impression. Growing up in Yorkshire as the child of an Indian immigrant parents, Kamiska remembers kids calling me things like monkey brain eater because the way Indians were depicted in films Indiana Jones, The Temple of Doom. But but while children's publishers have long exercised caution aware that children take stories very literally, an adult publisher publishing the use of sensitivity readers is infinitely more controversial. Do no harm. When are we going to get men that are sensitivity readers for erotica to make sure that no harm is done to the idea of uh, men? Because clearly that ain't happening when you got people sexually harassing a 16-year-old on TikTok. I'm just... I'm just saying. Can we uh, put this in a different frame to see just how ridiculous it is? 
Comisco stresses that authors can always just ignore the recommendations, but the biggest misconception about sensitivity reading, she says, is that it promotes blandness. I mean, it, it can, and it does. I think it's up to a person individually if whether or not they want to use it, but it shouldn't be forced on everybody, and you shouldn't be determined a bad person if you don't use it. It's almost exactly the opposite. We want things to be rich, but just flavored correctly. We want it flavored correctly, meaning in their way. We want it to just to taste like the correct recipe, but your recipe is not the only recipe. Is this the, how, how is this so hard to understand is the question. Often that means suggesting details writers can add to create livelier, more rounded characters. But she also recommended that authors ask themselves honestly whether they have the skills to tell a particular story. Stories that are about pain, stories that are about a person's color, stories about slavery, stories about colonialism. Those are the stories that aren't really easy for any for somebody else to write about. I would like to bring up The Blood Air, where it was about the Chinese slave trade and it was written by somebody who was a Chinese immigrant or a member of of, uh, uh, or an ascendant of a Chinese immigrant and it got dragged for trying to quote unquote appropriate black culture through slavery like can we talk about that yes no maybe because there is more than one way for any of this and the word slave itself comes from the Slavs uh, that were enslaved <laughs> like it's just so small-minded. All of this is so small-minded. They're like, no, it's about opening your mind. Open your mind. Come in with an open mind. Think about this in a certain way. But the only way to have an open mind is to do it my freaking way. This is this is just me convincing you. This this is my logic and reason saying just come in with an open mind. Do you get it? Do you get it? Since there is no official recognized qualification for sensitivity readers, standards may may well vary. Clanchy, who initially rewrote parts of Some Kids in response to the controversy, publicly ridiculed the three readers. Picador commissioned last autumn to double-check this new version. One, she wrote, scornfully even suggested that she made a typo with E.E. E. Cummings and lost his capital letters. See footnote. The version that she took to Swift was strictly her own work, yet on comparison to the original, almost all of the passages for which she was initially attacked had been rewritten. Gone are the chocolate skins and the almond shaped eyes, the mustaches and jarring autistic traits. A pen portrait of an obese ex pupil is noticeably softened, yet the book's spirit is, for better or worse, unchanged. If Picador had originally published something like this, could much grief have been avoided? Nah, because I think it just depends on whether or not somebody wants to take you down. Making tea in the basement kitchen of her house in Oxford, Clanchy reached for a mug emblazoned with a picture of her late mother, Joanne, once a well-known head teacher. She was she had spent months clearing out her parents' house, processing grief as she goes, and is feeling better than she did in December when she wrote for Prospect magazine about the shame of literary ostracism that had her want that made her want to die. But she still seems fragile, shrinking into the corner of an armchair, legs and arms protectively crossed. My book was not a racist book. It's an anti-racist book. And the way that it was portrayed completely misportrays the sense of passage, she says, firmly clutching the mug. She, she has a, see, and this is like comparing to earlier when some of the other ladies were like, I was attacked online and I had to have other people check my WhatsApp. Okay, this woman was suicidal. So you just... Everybody gets to experience different things. It doesn't dis discount anybody, but you are not the only victim, okay? And you got involved in calling on dogpiling on a woman, calling her things that she was not, and people pushed back, and you pretended that it was anything. That people pushed back on you. She has a new part-time teaching. She has a new part-time teaching job, but would rather I didn't say where in case of rec recriminations. She still does creative writing work with asylum seekers and is seeking and is writing poetry herself for the first time in years. Does she hope to be published again one day? I expect that I will write in a way. I think I'm interesting. I think that people are interested. Clanchy isn't sure if she has actually been canceled. My book has been depublished, which is very unusual. I have lost my living. Everyone I know has suffered. All of my personal relationships have suffered. So I've suffered and I'm shamed and I'm unhappy a lot of the time. I don't know if that's canceled, though. I'm not dead. She's been called a white supremacist, accused of Nazi-adjacent thinking, and says that some quite respectable people mocked her bereverent online, bereavement online. I think there is something about grieving that provokes rage. Why should she have sympathy when she than when we don't have sympathy? 
It's true. People go, look, I don't care about you because you don't care about it. That's such a circular. It's so destructive. She still doesn't know how, she says, why Picador initially decided against defending the book. Her editor, who was about to leave the imprint, wasn't party to the decision to issue an apology, but it was her prospect essay that triggered her final exit. Picador asked her not to write it after the PR disaster of Gwyn Jones's interview, but she didn't see why she shouldn't. After that, she says, both sides concluded it was over. Yet it sounds as if the relationship really began breaking down last summer when Picador apologized without consulting her, a decision that she thinks merely encouraged her critics. I'm not standing by the text, they said. You can say anything bad about the text, as bad as you like. It's a free-for-all. You can destroy this person's personal life. She removed the contested phrases from the new version of some kids because they couldn't be read without resurrecting Rose, she says, not because of the nece she necessarily agrees that they're offensive. The girls whose almond eyes she wrote about from the persecuted Hazara ethnic group in Afghanistan has since said publicly that she liked the description and sees it as part of her identity. Clanchi is adamant that Hazaras sees their eyes like part of the basis of their oppression. It's a politicized, important phrase, and to take it out and say that it was a piece of colonialism is a ludicrous and false caricature. Similarly, she wrote about one boy's chocolate skin, she says, because that's what that young person constantly used in their own work. It was, she adds, as a kind of hidden tribute to that person. I didn't mean to upset anybody, but I'm quite happy to remove it if it upsets people. Nah, stand by it. Stand by that kid. Don't care. These people never liked you, and they will never like you. That's the problem. But she audibly is exasperated with the sensitivity reader's response to what she regards as essentially factual statements like her bluntness assessing that children with fetal alcohol syndrome disorder don't progress in school. If we're going to object and say that because something is sad, then we mustn't say it, that's a fundamentally worrying thing about publishing. If she'd had sensitivity readers from the start, though, couldn't they have caught some of the wording that upset people and caused her such grief? She's unconvinced. There would always, she thinks, have been something. When I ask if, given the time, that she would still write some kids, she says, I think the controversy really took on a life of its own and hurt everybody, and I wish that it hadn't happened. But I don't unwish my book. I don't think that I shouldn't have written it. Her greatest regret, apart from no longer being invited to teach other teachers, is that ex-pupils who publicly defended her have been patronized and disbelieved. So, like, you get the sensitivity readers to not upset other people because those other people don't like how those children are being talked about. And then those children come out and say, like, I'm not offended. There's no problem here. And then those children are made fun of. So who is any of this protecting? It's not protecting anybody. It's a dictatorship by people using their feelings and their self-identifications to put themselves on the top of the pedestal to say how you can behave. And if you disagree, even if you are the one being talked about, you are going to now be on the chopping block for acting inappropriately. It is asinine. It is stuff that does not need to be listened to because it is just trying to cage your thought, to tell you how to think, to put you in the box. Come in open-minded, they say, and then they say open-minded means for me to mold with my little fingies between, between your brain. That's all that it is. Clanchi once conceded that she overreacted to the initial Goodreads criticism while insisting she genuinely didn't use some phrases falsely attributed to her, like slanted eyes and a Jewish nose, although she did write Ashkenazi nose, which, uh, excuse me, is that a problem? Because that is, is that not an ethnicity that has known attributes? Yes, no? She remains bewildered by what befell what she thinks of as a gentle liberal book and i truly don't understand although i obviously i worry and wonder about it a lot that's another thing is like people who are ready to go in angry and be set off and are already like taking everything in the worst way possible in order to call you things you know that something is up with someone when they immediately start out by going after you instead of actually talking about the content of the book if people are making personal claims at you are trying to slander you call you angry call you bigoted call you racist or upset or whatever they're setting up to villainize you for not agreeing with them in other creative industries, so-called cancel culture has proved a surprising elastic phenomenon with high-profile figures bouncing back from what looks like professional oblivion and a vigorous pro-speech movement emerging. The comedian Dave Chappelle returned to Netflix last year within months of being supposedly canceled for jokes deemed transphobic. Elon Musk promised to take over of Twitter may also change the roles to pl at play, with conservatives expecting the billionaire and free speech absolutist to end what they see as suppression of their views on social media. At least one veteran agent predicted that publishing too will eventually find a new 
equilibrium. I feel like the pendulum will swing not back to where it was, and I don't want it to where it was. It was a necessary correction, but like all pendulums swing, it's gone to a sort of crazy place. We'll come back to a new normal, and there will be important discoveries and new writers in that. Yet, few see a route back to the mainstream publishing for Planchi for reasons perhaps more complex than they look. Also, that only really works if you already have a profile. Because notice that it mentioned like basically billionaires and millionaires and really famous people with the elastic thing. It doesn't really work as well with smaller people like Clanche. She doesn't have the money. She doesn't have the clout. She doesn't have the popularity. It doesn't it doesn't work like that and they know it. So it's why they always go after people that are like indie publishers, indie published, small small people, even like that Caitlin What's-Her-Face recently who they went after. It's always after the newbies because you can't go after somebody like Stephen King or J.K. Rowling. They got screw you money. They don't have to listen. So it's a control mechanism for the newbies. Liberal as it undoubtedly is, there's something distinctly confrontational about some kids, thanks partly to Clanchy's compulsive candor about things more self-protective writers might withhold. Her feelings on escorting an 18-year-old ex-pupil to a gay club or comparing her pupil's instant scoffing of the biscuits contributed in class with what she regards as her own middle-class ability to resist instant gratification and stay slim. It's faintly reminiscent of Adam Kay's medical memoirs, This Is Going to Hurt, another Picador title recently adapted for television in which some perceived misogynistic undertones. Kay's labor ward tales of gory deliveries and prolapsed vaginas also describes things that he has witnessed but as a man cannot personally experience. He too wrote sometimes brusquely about people he saw as their, their most vulnerable. The positive birth campaigner Millie Hill has said that it's telling how many people found all of this hilarious right up until a woman who had endured a traumatic birth objected. Yet Khalil, a lifelong scorer of misogyny tells me that she loved Kay's book. In one woman, is one woman right and the other wrong? Or are these judgment calls, whether made by editors, sensitivity readers, critics, or book buyers, sometimes more subjective than we're comfortable acknowledging? In both books, there's a jangling disconnect between the sometimes abrasive narrative voice and their nurturing professions which throw the reader off balance. Kay says the TV producers praised his bravery in making your own character so actively dislikable, yet the occasional callousness many readers found hurtful can be indic an indicator of professional burnout in medicine, and Kay did ultimately quit. Had he smoothed that out, perhaps a dimension of that story would have been lost. Would the same be true if Clanchy had written something less spiky? As it is, both books reveal perhaps more than their authors consciously intended. The doctors aren't always caring that teachers can be judgmental in private, that good people can think harsh thoughts. It may even be the exposure of such unpalpable truths that turn writing into art, as the Orwell Prize criteria put it, but only perhaps where those truths are worth the pain. Uh, I mentioned on Thursday's video, one of my favorite writers is Brian Masters, and that's because of the way that he talks about things. And one of the things that he mentioned, I think it was in Killing for Company, about Dennis Nelson, that people put in writing truths that they basically put up masks for in conversation because things get out of you in writing that you don't even know. And that's how people can kind of pick things up about you in writing, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, because it gets so much more personal and it's so much more close than we realize. And that's fine. But taking things from these personal experiences, the less the less glamorous things, the less desirable things, and using them against people instead of just discussing the unfavorable things in society is damaging and fake. I don't think it's that people don't realize. I think it's that some of these people are using the fallibility of man, the weaknesses of man, as a bludgeoning tool in order to control the industry and thought and what is allowed to go through. And that is ultimately why I think that indie publishing is going to be the way to go, to have that freedom, because you've got these controllers. And as long as you tell them no, there's nothing that they can do. But the publishers are obviously not standing by publishers are obviously not standing by their authors and allowing that free thought to happen and instead are turning on them. At the end of the day, though, if you look at this, publishers are not standing by their by the authors. The best thing to do is to one, stand by your work, two, know how to edit, try to figure out how to edit, find people that you trust that will give you feedback, even if it's not what you're expecting. Try to find people that you trust that'll bring you a different perspective and help you think about your work in maybe a way that you haven't before. But I do want to close this out on a more positive note because publishing currently is a disaster. They're chasing trends more than anything. There's no sense in what they're doing with bringing in new people 
and the stuff is like carbon copies of everything. I personally enjoy what I'm doing where I'm reading new and new books, which speaking of which, because I got this in front of me, I recently received Lime's Fable by Igao-chan in the mail. Also perfect, beautiful cover, perfect cover for starting Year of the Dragon. And you find so much stuff looking into ind independent publishing with so many different options. So I want to end this with a couple of positives that I believe make indie publishing superior to traditional publishing. Yeah, traditional publishing has the money. Fine, whatever. Are they using it well? I don't think so. I think that they are missing out on a lot of things. But here are some of my top favorite things with independent publishing. Number one is control. Not just control of your manuscript, but actual control of getting to use it how you want, like collaboration. So one of my favorite things is uh, just over a year ago, probably like a year and a half ago at this point, well, give it a couple of months, it'll be on two years. Uh, I met Montana or M.M. Morris, who is now one of my creative writing partners. And we're working on books together. We got the Westies, we got the Easties, we got aliens on the horizon working out. And we somehow discovered that her her story, the Numinous series, and Body More, which I'd already published two books of when we met, had a lot in common. And guess what? Now they're a part of the same universe. So because I am independently published, I can actually take those characters and merge them with hers and bring them into her universe. And we can collaborate post-publication because I have the rights to do that. If I had gone traditionally published, I would not have the rights to my characters to do with them what I want. And so because I do, I can do whatever I want with my characters. If I want to make plushies of my characters, I can freaking do it and I would love to do it someday. If I want to collaborate with other people, if I want to do stories where our characters interact, I can do it. And so because of that, Monty and I have characters that are interacting, collaborating, and I can do that with anybody, anytime, anywhere. You also have the freedom to write what you want, make what you want, explore what you want. None of this purity testing on whether or not you can write certain ways, say certain offensive ideas, go wherever. Honestly, I think it's insane that people are more tolerant of a murdering main character than somebody who might be racist. Like, you also are not controlled only by commercial trend chasing and you have options to be more surprised other than you know outside of what is usually done with what is commercial fiction another thing that comes up when i think of traditional publishing is the story that is in the front of carrie and comfort by dan simmons and that is the story of his publication journey of that book where initially he finally got it picked up by a small independent publisher and while it was working through publication the publisher actually went bankrupt and was sold to a bigger publisher that took all of the manuscripts as part of that collateral he was then given a different agent who over time or a different editor who over time had him do different passes of editing on the book every single time saying it wasn't good enough it wasn't good enough until finally the editor was like you basically need to throw it on all you basically need to throw it all out and start over because I hate the entire book. Eventually, Dan Simmons worked to purchase the publication rights back to that book and then took it and published it somewhere else himself. And that is just a freaking horror story of publication and how publishers do not necessarily serve the authors and are sometimes just straight up destructive to the authors. I also look at like Iron Wing right now where it came out six months after freaking Fourth Wing. Iron Flame, that's what it is, Iron Flame and it's an 800 page book. I don't think that book is being served. I don't think that author is being served. I don't think that Light Lark was served well by its publisher either. I think they rushed it out because it was popular on trending and they wanted to make that money, but it didn't serve the book. And I think that that is a shame that publishers are more focused on making money and personal biases than what is what could sell in the the public and actually making a book work. They, they want to make the money. And that's one thing, but it's not doing the author or the book any service worst case scenario is you get dan simmons and they will hold your book forever or other things where you're like you sell your series and the first book doesn't sell well in the series and now that publisher owns all those characters in that series and you can never touch that again insanity i would be so distressed to not be able to do my characters anymore to do anything with them to own them to love them to finish their story screw that imagine if westies didn't get to have books two and three and the prequel to finish their story and let them be happy and let them work out like no 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 um another good thing about indies a superior thing about indies is you can work with whoever you want to work with you don't have to work with this editor who hates your freaking book you don't have to work with that guy over there who is going to argue with you about everything because they don't like your perspective you can work with whomever you desire so it's important 
And those are just those are just some of the top things that I think that make indie superior. And indie will rise as long as you talk about it, which goes into why I think it's so important to talk about all kinds of books, not just trad, not just indie, not just stuff that I love, but also stuff that I might not like because you'll like it possibly. There are just so many options out there. And the important thing is to talk about it to get it out there. So what am I saying? Don't be the publishing industry that is this constraining industry that is trying to use whatever it can to strangle the creativity, the thought, the difference of opinion out of creative writing to make it all standardized. Let's let art be art. Let's let discussions happen, whether they are in agreement or disagreement, doesn't matter. You don't have to all think the same. You don't have to absorb everything the same, and you don't have to agree on everything in order to get along. That's it. That's... That's my positive message for the week, <laughs> but I am so excited on what you guys will create, what I will find, and getting to share what I am creating alone and with my creative partners, both Monty and Sam for whenever Sam decides to start making stuff and we can make stuff again together. And anybody in the future that may or may not appear, hate them. With that said, thank you so much for watching. Let me know what your thoughts are on the article, on the conversation, on the industry. I think it's a disaster, obviously. I gave up on it six, seven years ago. The funny thing is, I gave up on it probably in 2018 after going to AWP a second time. And then I went to the FWA's writing conference and I gave it like another year because I felt pre slightly hopeful. And then I gave up again. I was like, okay, screw this. Screw this. My hope is gone. Going, looking at, looking at agents again, I'm like, Nope, nobody is ever going to like me. I don't freaking care. I'm a disaster and I accept that. But that, <laughs> anyway, let me know what your thoughts are on the subject. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great weekend and don't die. Was that Wayland Cross in the trunk? Do you know or is that something that's still being figured out? The person in the trunk was not Wayland Cross. Is he in trouble? We don't know who did it. But as the owner of the car, the longer he's missing, the worse it looks for him. Cross isn't a killer. For the last couple of years, the average number of murders in Baltimore has been over 300, and it's been going up. Mind you, that's only whatever the badges count as official murder, and believe me, there are people that don't count when they die. Wayland? If you're down here, tell me. I'm not talking to the badges, I just... I've been looking for you. They found a body in your trunk, Way. Why? Did you do that? To the left, plain black letters read along the wall. You walked in the corridor. Once that ends, you chose the dark is on the right. My vision goes blurry. Flickers black and black and black for longer intervals until I can't see anything at all. I'm not screaming anymore, but my voice echoes back to me. Where the hell am I? You're dead, Josephine. Even smart people do stupid shit sometimes, right? <laughs>